It's midwinter, 1657. John Washington looks over his ship, which has just run aground off the coast of Virginia. His cargo of tobacco was ruined. John had put his life savings into the voyage, and now it was all lost. The ship could be saved, but the tobacco he planned to sell in England was worthless. John was 24, born in England. His father, a clergyman, had died penniless five years earlier. So John faced an agonizing decision. Was he going to go back to England empty-handed? Or would he take his chances in the new colony of Virginia? 120 years later, John's great-grandson, George Washington, would become the first president of the United States. Most people, when they study the origins of the United States and colonial period, think about New England. Think about the Pilgrims. Think about the Puritans. Most are not familiar with the name of John Washington. He was an immigrant to Virginia. This guy comes over here, founds a family that three generations later produces uh, this iconic figure, George Washington, whose story will be told in future centuries. The Washington family does reflect remarkably accurately a considerable number of the social, economic, and religious changes of the 16th and 17th centuries, increasing social mobility, religious and political tensions, immigration. Those are big themes in any English history textbook, and the Washingtons have got them all in their family. For the Washingtons, the story centers around their ancestral home, Sulgrave Manor. The story of the Washingtons at Sulgrave begins with John's great-great-grandfather, Lawrence, the builder of Sulgrave Manor, 150 years earlier. It was the time of Henry VIII, and England was at peace for the first time in 400 years. Lawrence had been offered an excellent job and had moved south from his home in the north of England. He didn't know it then, but this was an opportunity that was going to change his life and his family's fortunes forever. And really, for 400 years, young men like Lawrence Washington, they're able to make their way in the world other than by the force of arms. They can make it through peaceful means, trade, expanding rapidly, industry, and, of course, through farming and various other peaceful means. The first known reference to the Washington family is actually in the 12th century, based around the village of Wessington in northern England. At that time, the English language wasn't standardized and was full of different pronunciations and spellings. But by the time of Henry VIII, it had become more standard, and the Wessingtons were known as the Washingtons. In the 13th and 14th century, people of this class made their livings by fighting. They were knights. And this is why the Washingtons have a coat of arms. The Washington coat of arms, with its stars and its stripes, is something that uh, has very obviously had a big influence on the American flag. The Washingtons gained their coat of arms right back in the first place by valor in battle. And the stars that you see on the shield, of course, are not really stars. It's a reference to the spurs on the boots that were worn by people on top of their horses riding into battle. Now, in the early 16th century, during the peaceful reign of Henry VIII, the Washingtons made their living as caretakers for the estates of rich noblemen. Lawrence was an educated young man, and in his mid-twenties had been given the job of looking after the properties of Lord William Parr, who was one of the richest noblemen in England. In 1529, Lord Parr sent young Lawrence 150 miles south to manage his properties near Northampton. Northampton was a busy market town in the centre of the burgeoning wool trade. So Lawrence is well placed at 29, with good contacts, but also extraordinarily well placed because a whole new era in English history was about to open up. 
Prosperity brought tremendous business opportunities for ambitious young men, and thus prospects for social advancement. But within six months of coming down, um, Lawrence decides to leave the employees Sir William Parr because when he gets down to Northampton, he discovers that his cousin is actually making a fortune out of the wool trade. So he decides that here's an opportunity to make some real money. Here's an opportunity, perhaps, to drag himself out of the more subservient class to that of the landowning gentry. While he was in Northampton, he seems to have come to a life-changing decision. He left the very safe position he held with Lord Parr. And then he sets himself up as a wool merchant in Northampton itself. At the same time, he married Elizabeth Gough, a rich widow of a wool merchant. He took over her husband's business and became evidently very successful very fast. Lawrence took over not only the wool business Elizabeth had inherited from her late husband, but also his properties in and around Northampton. This advanced Lawrence's social position and brought him into contact with the landholding gentry. And the very next year, in 1532, only having been in Northampton for less than three years, Lawrence Washington is voted Mayor of Northampton. So in 1533, his new wife uh, conceives, but sadly both she and the baby die in childbirth. And very speedily, Lawrence married again. And he married another rich widow, Amy Pargeter, who in fact was from a village very close to Sulgrave and had been married to a Sulgrave man. Like Lawrence's first wife, Amy had been married to a prominent wool merchant. So Lawrence continued to expand both his land holdings and his business connections. If there isn't a man who isn't an opportunist as Lawrence Washington, there never will be. I mean, there he is, he's already got a, a terrific post in one of the richest families of England, and yet he sees an opportunity to, to make even more money, and he grabs it. And in three years, he's wheedled his way into a, a society that he's never been involved in. He obviously had charm, he obviously had uh, a personality. I think you've got to see him as somebody who always had the eye for the main chance. That's why he succeeds. <laughs> Lawrence was fortunate because his younger brother Thomas had also entered the wool business. And Thomas had moved to Belgium to become head of the Wool Merchants Association in Antwerp. And from that position, he was able to give Lawrence valuable inside information about the trade in wool between England and Europe, and so advance his business interests. So you can almost see that between the Washingtons producing wool and through that link now with the port of Antwerp, you've almost got the mafia of the wool trade, bringing in quality goods from Europe so that they could enjoy a lifestyle the like of which they've not had before. At this time, Henry VIII was having problems with the Catholic Church. Since his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, had not given him a son. He wanted the marriage annulled so he could marry again. Anne Boleyn, a maid of honor at court, caught the king's eye. But we mustn't think of this simply as a great romance or as a man who went through multiple divorces and beheaded two wives. There is a great theme under this, a serious theme. England must have a male heir. Hence, these marriages are about the peace of England, the long-term stability. But the Catholic Church would not allow divorce and wouldn't allow Henry to dissolve his marriage to Catherine. Unwilling to accept the Pope's refusal, Henry split with the church and seized the lands that belonged to the Catholic monasteries. The monastic orders for centuries before had been the controlling power of England. They had acquired vast amounts of money. They owned one third of England. But by the middle of the 16th century, most of the monastic orders were in a state of complete decadence. They'd lost all their charitable meaning, all their Christian concepts had gone out of the window. Henry VIII then dissolves the monastic order. He throws all the monks out to become beggars on the street. He takes all their money. And then, of course, he sells off its land to whoever wishes to purchase it. 
Lawrence finds himself in the right place at the right time. He controlled property through his two marriages, but much of it was rented from the monasteries. Now he's able to buy what he'd only been renting. So the dissolution of the monasteries, which begins in 1536, is a pivotal moment in the history of the Washington family. So Lawrence Washington, typical nouveau rich, having made money through a peaceful England, is now able to buy his own estate and to set himself up. And these included what became the family manor house and the family ancestral property at Sulgrave Manor in Northamptonshire. And what does that buy him? Well, that buys him two complete villages, all the buildings, all the people, all the land round about. It amounted to over 3,500 acres in all. Now he is part of the landowning gentry. It's now that he builds Sulgrave Manor House to be a home for his second wife, Amy, and eventually their 11 children. The building of Sulgrove House is in itself very, very typical of houses of this date and type. It's very much what you would expect of the house built by somebody who was wealthy, but not super rich, somebody doing okay. When Lawrence came here, he probably built a relatively small house. And as the family grew, and more importantly, as his wealth grew, he was able to add more and more rooms. The decoration on the south porch at Sulgrave tells the world that Lawrence makes his money from sheep. The triangle is a symbol of the wool merchant's guild and it's supported by two sheep's heads. Below that, you have the ultimate mark of success in late Tudor England, and that is a coat of arms of Queen Elizabeth I. It's got a great big great hall, which is the sort of business room of the house. That's where everything happens. It's where it's sort of like part office, part living room, part dining room. This is where the servants were coming in and out, the shepherds were coming in and out, the steward and the lord were doing their business. So it's a very public area where also the family would have eaten. This table would accommodate not only Lawrence, Amy and their 11 children, but three or four of the most important servants as well. Though other servants, of course, would be required to wait on the servants. The table is called the board. The top has two sides a rough side for daily work and a shiny side for special occasions. The board has given us a number of expressions we still use today. For instance, if your host didn't think well of you, your meal would be served on the rough side of the board and you'd have the tables turned on you. And sitting around the board, everyone would be on benches and stools, except the most important person who would be given a proper chair. Chairs were valuable items. And this is where we get the term chairman of the board. Mr. Washington during this period was away on business an awful lot. He had business interests in Northampton and also visits down to London. A lot of traveling, a lot of living away from home. So when he's away, Mrs. Washington is the head of the household in charge of the whole estate. Year round, there would be crops to plant and harvest land and livestock to maintain. But the real business of Sulgrave was wool. The men would herd and care for the sheep, and in the spring, the hard work of shearing would begin. Most of the wool would then be collected and sold to brokers and weavers in town. The wool that was kept for use at the manor would be carded and spun by the women in the household. A place of Sulgrave's size would need a staff of 20 to 30 people, depending on the season. Shearing and harvest times would be the busiest, and those workers would need to be housed and fed on the property. Between the Washingtons, with their 11 children, and all the servants and workers, there were many mouths to feed, so work went on in the kitchen all day long. The women at Sulgrave Manor would cook and clean, They'd make butter and cheese, 
brew beer and make medicines from the kitchen herb garden. During the day, the main bedroom in Saltgrave is a private space away from the hustle and bustle of the hall downstairs. And it's also a place where particularly the women of the household would be doing a lot of their tasks. So spinning, uh, sewing, all those sorts of small scale indoor domestic stuff. At night, quite a different thing. At night, the main bed is occupied by Mr. and Mrs. And then around the bed are many other people sleeping. Younger children and junior servants sleep on the floor in the same room on pull-out beds. The curtains on this bed, the hangings on the bed, would be of the most gorgeous stuff that you could afford to have. It's a status thing, it's a showing off thing, as well as being warm and comfy. And in the depths of winter in Britain, when it's flipping freezing and you've got almost no central heating and maybe not even particularly good glass in the windows, you want to be away from the drafts. It's a real luxury to be able to pull the curtains and be warm inside. It also gives a degree of privacy. And in rooms which are shared between many, many people, privacy is a luxury. So using textiles, embroideries, is part of the sort of armory of getting on in the world, putting on a good show so that everything's, mm, I see the Washington family are doing all right. Entertaining at Sulgrave is an important part of life. In Tudor England, you're always making connections, both for business and to find good matches for your sons and daughters. And those connections may bring you closer to nobility or even royalty. And entertaining on a lavish scale shows others you're financially stable. They're aiming at making people think that they're credit worthy. That's particularly important. This is a world before proper banking. So if you want to have a loan, people have to believe that you're going to be able to pay it back. So if you put on a really good display of being, we're doing all right, thank you very much, People think, oh, it's safe to loan them money. They'll be all right to do business with, because I'll get me money back. So actually, from a business point of view, keeping up appearances had a lot of usefulness to it. The children at Selgrave were taught to read and write, usually by tutors who traveled from house to house. Ah, first, so down at the bottom here. So there were a lot of people who had a bit of education, who nonetheless couldn't write, but could just about read enough to read the Bible. And that, of course, was the main point. Start from there. So in Sulgrave, the chances are that probably about half the people in the house could read and write, to some degree, to some level. Very well done. When Lawrence and Amy moved to Sulgrave, the property included the church of St. James the Less, which was built in the 1300s and still stands today. It was at this church that the Washington family worshipped. Many of them were married and buried there as well. As Lord of the Manor, Lawrence had the Washington family pew in the front of the church, closest to the altar. Lawrence, Amy and their eldest son, Robert, are buried in a tomb at the foot of the pew. And attached to the tombstone are brass plates representing Lawrence, Amy and their 11 children. It's worth remembering that the English parish church in the 16th century serves as parish hall, meeting place, center for family occasions like baptisms, marriages, funerals. The church is very much the center of community life and not just a place of religious worship. In 1547, Henry VIII died, and the country was thrown into turmoil. Eventually, his eldest daughter, Mary, took the throne. Queen Mary was a devout Catholic who immediately re-established Catholicism as the national religion. It was an abrupt and brutal reversal of Henry's establishment of the Protestant Church of England 11 years earlier. Mary actively persecuted Protestants, burning over 300 of them at the stake and earning her the title Bloody Mary. 
but she died after only five years on the throne and was succeeded by Henry's daughter, Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth I was one of the strongest and most successful monarchs in English history. She re-established the Church of England and standardized religious practice. The Elizabethan era was a golden age for England. It was the time of Shakespeare, expanding trade and global exploration. We remember the reign of Elizabeth I as glorious, and in many ways it was. Navigational skills, maritime skills, familiarity with Atlantic waters, all that is increasing very considerably across Elizabeth's reign. And without that background, the founding of colonies like Virginia or Massachusetts would scarcely have been possible. Lawrence Washington's family and fortunes grew during Elizabethan times. And surprisingly, all of his 11 children survived into maturity. In Tudor times, between one third and one half of children died before they were five, so the Washingtons were of hardy stock. And Lawrence himself died when he was 84, which was unusually long lived. In his efforts to settle his family, Lawrence was relatively successful. All of his daughters were well married off to people of wealth and standing commensurate to Lawrence's at the time. And his sons were, as was normal, put into different trades. Lawrence's eldest son, Robert, joined him in the wool trade and inherited Sulgrave Manor. He married the heiress, Elizabeth Light, and she brought more land into the Washington family. Marrying well was the key for success in any family in Tudor England. And not only were the Washingtons marrying into families associated with overseas trade, important mercantile families, they also managed to marry into court life. Through these marriages, they gained contacts which grant them special favors at court. Several are awarded knighthoods, and one grandson acquires lands that include the ancient monument at Stonehenge. Queen Elizabeth was succeeded by her cousin, King James I, who continued to expand England's prosperity. The first successful English colony in America, called Jamestown, was founded in Virginia in 1607. In 1620, pilgrims on the ship Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts. But James fought with Parliament. Parliament controlled taxes and did not approve of his extravagant spending. James managed to keep the conflict under control. But when he died after a 22-year reign, his son, King Charles I, was faced with the same problem, a Parliament that refused to let him spend as he pleased. By the 1630s, under Charles I, who was a much less politically skilled king than his father, those religious and political tensions were escalating sharply. Charles is forced to call a parliament simply because he wants money. Parliament refuses to give him that money. There is a stalemate between the king and parliament. King Charles wanted money to wage war in Europe and fight rebellion in Scotland, along with a list of other expensive projects. A rebellious group of Protestants emerged who called themselves Puritans. They vehemently supported Parliament in limiting the King's spending. The Puritans became more and more powerful as King Charles spent with abandon. Meanwhile, the Washingtons, who benefited greatly from their marriages to noble families, continue to be strong supporters of the king. And the family tree continue to grow. Lawrence the Builder has a son named Lawrence, who also has a son named Lawrence. And Lawrence's son, Robert, also has a son named Lawrence. The Lawrence name gets complicated in telling the Washington story. With so many children having large families, the name Lawrence appears in each generation, always once and sometimes more. Life would be so much easier if 
in 16th century England, they'd been a bit more inventive in their choice of names, particularly the Washington family, where every second person is called Lawrence or Robert. Robert's grandson, also named Lawrence, would be the father of John Washington, the emigrant to the New World. This Lawrence was the fifth son of 17 children born at Sulgrave. By the time you get to the fifth son, you've basically run out of land to be able to set them up in their own manners. So you've got to find them a career. And after trade and land, the only other source of a career was the church in those days. And the church, like the court, was a way of making sure that you had a job for life. Lawrence was sent to Oxford University, which was the main training ground for the Church of England. It was the place to be for a young man wanting to rise through the church hierarchy. When he graduated, he was immediately elected a fellow, which was the first step toward higher office in the church establishment. Lawrence's career became, from this point, totally caught up in the developments which were to lead a few years later to the English Civil War. King Charles vigorously suppressed the increasingly militant Puritans because they supported Parliament. His main agent was the Archbishop of Canterbury, the brilliant but manipulative William Lord. Lord came from a lower middle class family. He'd made his way by his brains through the University of Oxford, a formidable, highly intelligent, dislikable man. That's clearly how he struck a great many people. Lord's personal agenda was to shape a generation that will take over the Church of England and through Oxford, he has a big chance of doing so. Besides being leader of the Church of England, William Lord was Chancellor of the University of Oxford. And with King Charles I's active support, he used his position at Oxford to weed out Puritan sympathizers. They basically sacked everybody, declaring them to be heretics, declaring them to be too radical and not uh, acceptable Anglicans. So men who want a significant role in the university must be prepared to accept Archbishop Lord's agenda. And it's interesting that, that we have a Washington in exactly that role in Oxford. Lawrence was either pushed forward or stepped forward to fill one of the jobs that then became vacant. And he became responsible for the discipline, and that includes the religious discipline, of Oxford University. This was a big promotion for Reverend Lawrence, but it meant he had to act as Lord's eyes and ears and report on students and teachers at the college who might have had Puritan leanings. One has to have some sympathy with him because this would have been an extremely exposed position to be in. By taking that job, he had identified himself with Lord and the King, and thus made himself a large number of enemies. Reverend Lawrence kept his job at Oxford for less than a year. He left voluntarily, but whether it was because of political pressure or because he wanted a comfortable living with a church congregation outside the university, we're not sure. Once Lawrence had decided to resign his fellowship and to move from the university into the church, he also was free of one of the constraints of being a fellow of Oxford University, which was that you were not allowed to be married. What we do know is that the Reverend Lawrence met a young woman called Anne Phyllis Twigden, who came from a comfortable family near London. They were married, and five months after leaving Oxford in 1632, their first son, John, was born. Having served Archbishop Lord well in Oxford, Lawrence was given the position of rector in the town of Purley. It was a rich and comfortable town in the east of England and a prestigious appointment for Lawrence. It's a plum job. Being a rector is a very socially significant, prestigious, economically 
highly desirable position. Purley was a prosperous town, but it was a hotbed of Puritanism at the time. So he found himself in a community with views diametrically opposed to his own. He was in a position where, deep, as it were, in enemy Puritan territory, he was having to try and be a good Anglican priest. Now, this is in a day when most people don't read, when there is no public broadcasting. The only voice that you can guarantee every person in England would hear at least once a week is the voice of the vicar. And therefore, they are the people through which Parliament and the Puritans had to make sure their message was being relayed. In spite of growing political tension, the Washingtons continued to profit handsomely from their connections to nobility and the royal court. Two of Reverend Lawrence's brothers were knighted and his nephew Henry became a captain in the King's army. But the country was headed for civil war. Both the Parliament and the King start raising forces. The kingdom is divided. Almost every village finds itself divided. Men have to ask themselves, which side are you on? Recruiting is widespread across the whole country. The Washingtons were strongly on the Royalist side. And in 1642, in what was to be the first battle of the Civil War, the parliamentarians faced the Royalist forces across the field at Edge Hill. And the Reverend Lawrence's nephew, Henry, was fighting on the King's side. In the Civil War, the Washingtons were very involved physically in providing soldiers and being on the battlefields themselves. They were involved in the very first battle of the Civil War, which took place just 15 miles from Soulgrave at Edge Hill. They were involved at another battle that took place just five miles from Soulgrave at Crawfordy Bridge. These great battles, skirmishes, vital control points, are very close to Soulgrave. So anyone living at Soulgrave in the outbreak of war would have been more conscious than most English people of what was happening. Solgrave Manor itself was laid to siege during the Civil War in 1644. Four Royalist soldiers were given refuge at Solgrave Manor until they were captured after a siege by parliamentarians. And just 30 miles away, two members of the Washington family died in the Siege of Oxford. The Church of England, the Anglican Church, came under attack early in the war. In 1643, shortly after fighting broke out, Parliament began to investigate the allegiance of English priests. The Reverend Lawrence Washington, as a well-known supporter of the Royalist cause, becomes one of their first targets. And he is literally dragged before the courts. Puritan courts find him uh, guilty of all sorts of misdemeanors against the Puritan ethic. Reverend Lawrence is branded as a scandalous, malicious priest, accused of being a drunk, and I think of swearing. And I don't think those charges are credible. I think he's removed mainly because he's part of the established church that the reformers want to get at. So there you have the Reverend Lawrence, aged 41, the father of five children, had been living a very comfortable life up until this point, suddenly suffering a complete reversal of his fortunes in the English Civil War. The Rev Lawrence was thrown out of his comfortable position at Purley. He became so impoverished that his wife and their five children had to move back to her parents' home near London. Devoted to the church, he was able to secure a part-time position as a preacher in the nearby village of Little Braxted. Little Braxted was a poor community with a tiny, roughly built church, nothing like the grand and prosperous church at Purley. It would have been a humiliating come down for Reverend Lawrence. He is in fact very lucky because the majority 
of the priests who lost their living in this way were not able to find other livings, but he was offered a smaller, much poorer church, not that far away, where he spent the rest of his life uh, keeping his head down. When the Reverend Lawrence was banished Little Braxted, the war was in its third year. It would rage on for another seven long years. But all the way through, the Washingtons allied themselves with the king. This was exemplified by the Reverend Lawrence's nephew, Henry, who by the end of the war had risen to the rank of colonel in the king's army. Colonel Henry Washington was the last royalist commander to give up his command to the parliamentary forces. He himself had made a great declaration that he was never going to give up until the last person had died. The royalist forces finally surrendered. Oliver Cromwell took over as Lord Protector of England. King Charles was captured, tried and convicted of treason. A scaffold was erected at Whitehall, and before a large crowd, some cheering, some dismayed, the king was beheaded. So by the defeat of the royalist forces and the capture of the king, the trial and the ultimate execution of the king, the losing side really do feel that they have lost everything, and the winning side is very vengeful after these terrible seven years of warfare. Cromwell systematically persecutes all the families that had previously supported the king. And virtually all the Washingtons that had supported the king and had risen through to positions of power, wealth, and property found that at one foul swoop, this was all lost. Sulgrave Manor, was one of the few Washington properties to stay in the family during the course of the Civil War. By the end, it was owned by their cousins, the Makepeace family. The Reverend Lawrence died just as the war ended, having spent the rest of his career at Little Braxton. And when he dies in 1653, all the circumstances suggest that he's a, a broken man in material resources and in terms of his own place in that society. And it's into that uh, situation that his son has to figure out where he's going to go. Reverend Lawrence's eldest son, John, was 19 at the end of the Civil War. In the wake of his father's disgrace, there was no family property for John to inherit. So he had to forge a new path for himself. His decision would change the Washington family's fortunes and eventually transform the new world. London after the Civil War was a burgeoning center of finance and international trade. It was a magnet for ambitious young men from good families who had not inherited property and were looking to make their way in the world. London, where John is in the 1650s, is at the epicenter of the changes that are taking place in England. In many ways, it was what the United States was like in the 1960s. It was a period of enormous turbulence, socially, culturally, uh, po certainly politically, uh, in, in the wake of the uh, killing of the king. All traditional values were up for grabs. The wild expansion in London merchant activity was directly tied to the growth of the New World colonies. Ships returning from America bore exotic goods as well as exotic tales of a rich new land, transforming how the English lived and thought. As the horizon of possibilities expanded, announcements throughout the kingdom touted opportunities for investors, sailors and settlers. It would mean that a great many men took back to their villages, to their towns, news of colonial developments, Perhaps they'd tried tobacco, perhaps they'd tried oranges, perhaps they'd tried potatoes. Perhaps they'd had personal experience of what the New World Trade was doing. The possibilities offered 
by Virginia would have been common knowledge within various branches of the Washington family. It's the sort of thing you talk about at family gatherings at Christmas and Easter. When John is in London in the 1650s, there were a variety of things he might have done. And the merchant of oceanic trade has emerged as a new cultural model for young people to uh, emulate. And the trade of the time, the sailing trade, was tobacco. And as a young man of 18, 19, his best course was to become a merchant trader. Oceanic trade, it was what high tech is today. That's where the future was. And it was the most exciting place to be. We know that John had become a skilled sailor because in 1656, when he was 24, he received an offer from a ship owner named Edward Prescott to be the second master of the Seahorse of London, a ship that traded tobacco with the colony at Virginia. A second in command, he shared the responsibility for taking the ship safely across the perilous waters of the Atlantic. Traveling across the Atlantic Ocean in the 17th century was dangerous. An awful lot of people died on the crossing or died within a year or so of, 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 of disease. Virginia, in particular, was a very unhealthy place through most of the 17th century. So Virginia was, in some ways, the Wild West of the 17th century for, for Englishmen who were ambitious enough and daring enough. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. These are people who are open to the main chance and who are willing to take a risk. And the people who don't do that stay back in England and try to find a place for themselves in that traditional society. It does seem to me that when we talk about John Washington, he has some archetypal American traits of resilience and willingness to try something new, however dangerous and way out of his comfort zone going to Virginia. John had a small inheritance from his mother, so he was able to partner with Prescott and own a share of the ship's cargo. In mid-1656, they set sail for the Baltic and Copenhagen, where the two men loaded the ship with cloth, tools and household goods to trade in Virginia for tobacco. From there, they set off on their voyage to the New World. The trip across the Atlantic could take five to 10 weeks, Many ships never made it to their destination. But John and Prescott's ship arrived safely in Virginia in the late fall of 1656 and began making its way along the coast. They would be sailing up and down that very fragmented coast because on most of the bays and most of the rivers, on most of the creeks, there would be a plantation and each plantation would deal directly with the ships. John and Prescott successfully traded their European goods in Virginia for a full load of tobacco. They were anxious to sail back to England as soon as possible to avoid the winter storms in the North Atlantic. But the ship was overloaded. In their haste, moving through the shallows of the Potomac River, the ship ran aground at Pope's Creek. The hull flooded and all the tobacco was ruined. John has run aground in Virginia, and his whole tobacco cargo is destroyed. A basement. His life, his career, his merchants. John had put all his money and all his hopes into the partnership with Prescott. But now he was left penniless. The ship could be repaired, so John could go back to England. But he would have to start all over again with nothing. This must have been a pivotal moment to stay in Virginia or to go back to England. By the time he was having to make this decision, his prospects in America must have looked a lot better than his prospects in England, in the sense that there were fortunes to be made here. And we have to remember this wasn't necessarily the usual story, because we now know how many families, individuals, found it too hard in the new world 
and went home. But England is not attractive to a royalist family. So despite the loss of his burgeoning merchant career, John stays in Virginia and American history is transformed. Right away, John and Prescott sue each other in the Virginia court over the ruined cargo. And the two of them fall out over this, accuse each other of negligence. And the argument gets so bitter that they bring in the lawyers. The judge who heard John and Prescott's case was Nathaniel Pope, the owner of the plantation where the seahorse had run aground. John must have made quite an impression on Nathaniel Pope. For the judge, in settling the case, not only paid John's debt to Prescott out of his own money, but within a year had married his daughter Anne to the penniless newcomer. One of the richest families at that time was Nathaniel Pope's family. Nathaniel Pope was one of the first people to settle across from Maryland. Now, Anne was a native-born Virginian and a very desirable marriage prospect for all Virginians at the time. So we are left with the question of why did Nathaniel Pope choose to allow his daughter to be married to this sailor who had turned up, um, who probably didn't have many credentials um, that Nathaniel Pope was aware of. It's an interesting conundrum. Women were in considerable demand. There was a surplus of men. The ratio was probably about one woman to three men. So Anne Pope presumably had other possibilities, other options. Maybe he saw John as an immediate help in the business. John did have the skills of being able to read and write, which Nathaniel didn't have. But I have to think that it shows probably that John Washington had a certain sort of something about him. And maybe John and Anne just fell in love. We shouldn't exclude that as a possibility. Pope gave the new couple a generous wedding gift of 700 acres of Mattox Creek near his own home. And John partnered with Pope, growing tobacco and trading with the English ships. And over the next 10 years, through shrewd investment, the men grew their land holdings to 5,000 acres, which included Mount Vernon, and was to become George Washington's own home. I think the importance of Washington's story is it illustrates how the immigrants who founded families in the 17th century nurtured a culture of commerce that influenced their sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons. John's younger brother, Lawrence, moved to Virginia from England in 1659 to join him in his business. Their sister arrived in 1679. John became a judge and was later elected to the House of Burgesses, which was the council that represented Virginia to the king in England. John's son and grandsons followed in his footsteps, accumulating land and becoming leaders in the colony. And within three generations, the wealth, power, and the Washingtons grows and grows and grows until in 1732, at that self-same spot, Pope's Creek in Virginia, is born George Washington, who becomes obviously the first president of the United States. And it seems that the Washingtons establishment there and their expansion there replicates almost directly the establishment of the wealth of the Washingtons in Tudor England by his five times great-grandfather, Lawrence Washington. From the first Lawrence coming down from Lancashire to John Washington going to Virginia, there seems to be a willingness to take a hard-headed decision of improvement. It shows perhaps the same practicality, the same emotional toughness, the same resilience in the face of whatever fortune throws at you. With George Washington, I think one can see some element of that family pragmatism and ambition. Like his ancestors, George Washington made several bold and unexpected changes in his life. Transforming himself from a soldier in his youth 
to a gentleman farmer, and finally, in his 40s, becoming a military leader and political revolutionary. It might seem ironic that the Washingtons, who for over a century benefited so much from their associations with nobility, spawned George Washington, who was to lead America in the break with England and the king, and was to become the first president of the new and independent United States. Sogrid Manor House represents the culmination of the career of Lawrence Washington, an individualist. And of course, surely, that is what the American nation was founded on, giving each individual the opportunity of making their life something more than it had been in the past. A new world, the new world. What we are trying to do here at Sawgrave Manor is to point out the degree of shared history, the relationship between the peoples. We are where we are as a house because the Washingtons moved. We are where we are as two nations because not only did John Washington move physically, George Washington moved philosophically. They established that this house should be set up and supported as a symbol of the friendship and goodwill between the two peoples of America and Britain. And it should be a center from which these sentiments will forever radiate. That's our job. It's not a job that any other place in England 